So welcome everyone to the Plant a Seed campaign's kickoff town hall call. This um, campaign, I'm excited for it this year because we are focusing on the three sisters from the Ark of Taste, so a bean, a corn, and a squash. And we've already sent out about 500 kits from our office to folks all over the country. It's really been really exciting to pack up these little kits and then send them off and um, send them to gardens all over the all over the country. So the hope of this call is to help you prepare your garden for these seeds that we're sending out. And um, we have some a, a really good panel here to help you get started. Um, before I we get into the content here, I just wanted to um, share a few things of Slow Food News that's coming up from the national organization. Um, my name is Anna Mule. I'm the Director of Communications and Campaigns with Slow Food USA, based in Brooklyn here. Um, um, just before I start, um, some housekeeping. If you could mute yourself when you come on, that would be super helpful. We're trying to keep background noise to a minimum. And I'll also mute people as they come on to avoid, um, to avoid the background sounds. But um, with Slow Food USA, we're really excited to have our um, summer festival happening again this year in Denver. Slow Food Nations will happen from July 13th through 15th um, in downtown Denver, right on the street outside. We have a great lineup that we'll be announcing um, in mid-April. We're currently um, open to um, the Leader Summit registration. So if you are a slow food leader or just someone who is passionate about food and connecting with other leaders across the country, the Slow Food Nation's Leader Summit is a really exciting opportunity that will be on Friday, July 13th. Um, and we'll kind of kick off the festival. And then the Saturday and Sunday of the festival are open to the public. We have you know, some really exciting summits that give an in-depth look at certain food issues. But then we also have a taste marketplace with producers and exhibitors from around the country and even the world. Um, so if you know of anyone who's interested in exhibiting at Slow Food Nations, the taste marketplace is a really great opportunity to show your um, work to a, a really great audience. Um, it's an, an exciting um there's a lot of energy and excitement there um, at the festival. The other big event that we have happening is Terra Madre. This happens, um, it's hosted by Slow Food International, which is our, our parent mothership in Italy. Um, the delegate applications are now open um, to apply to be a delegate at Terra Madre. I have the link here, slowfoodusa.org slash terra.madre. Um, be, there's two options for being a delegate year this year. You can either apply for a scholarship, which covers your room, board, and local transportation, not airfare, but the rest of it. Or if you're going on your own, you can just register, and then we'll invite you to our national meeting and um, clue you in on the other communications happening. So that is September 20th through 24th in Turin, Italy. Um, I think then I will just launch into today's presenters and I thank all of you so much for being part of this call. Um, I'm gonna introduce Pamela, um, Pam Sherman, and then she'll in turn introduce the others. Um, Pam Sherman came to us um, a few weeks before we kicked off the campaign and we had a call with her and she was just so excited about gardening and she opened my mind to a lot of things around the three sisters and I just really appreciate her expertise and excitement. She's been our garden research res resource coordinator for the Facebook group. Um, and it's just been a real joy to work with. So Pam, thank you so much. And let me turn it over to you for this call. Thank you, Anna. I'm really honored to be with this Three Sisters group. And there are amazing resources in this Three Sisters group in the form of people teachers, garden coordinators, administrators, farmers, gardeners, seed keepers, stewards and teachers, new gardeners, slow food members of all backgrounds from so many states, countries, and cultures. There's so much potential for learning with all of us sharing here. So please keep up your sharing. 
share your expertise, your mm-hmm. questions. No question is stupid. Your passions, your comments, and most of all, your stories, because that's how this keeps going. On this call, each presentation will be 10 minutes long. Then after the presentations, we'll open it up for questions and discussion. Please write your questions in the chat box as you think of them, and then we'll ask them in the order in which they were written. Our presenters today are Stephen and Cindy Scott, owners of Terroir Seeds Underwood Gardens in Tucson, Arizona, and Clark Harshbarger, resource soil scientist with the USDA NRCS, i.e. the Natural Resources Conservation Service, which was created after the Dust Bowl as the Soil Conservation Service. Our other presenter, Michael Bronner, co-owner of Harlequin's Gardens Nursery in Boulder, Colorado, who has advised gardeners on soil health for 30 years, will be presenting in written form on an organic gardening blog at Mother Earth News, which will be posted to our group. I want to start by thanking the ancestors of all of us, whether blood ancestors, cultural ancestors, or geographical ones. Those who first bred corn, beans, and squash for people to eat, which have kept people alive for 10,000 years. Thank you to all the men, women, and children, gardeners and farmers throughout all the generations of these past 10,000 years who have nurtured these food plants as much as these plants have nurtured them, each keeping the other alive right down to us, to the seeds we hold in our hands, or may have planted already. We are all in their debt. These people cared for soil so they and their descendants might live. May we do the same. Our first presenter is Clark Harshbarger, resource soil scientist with the USDA NRCS, trained in the use of holistic management, a process that teaches us to think in terms of whole systems. Over the last 20 years, Clark has observed soils all across the country on both private and public rangeland, cropland, and forest land. You're on, Clark. Thanks, Pam, for the introduction. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, so before I get started, um, I know many of you don't know who I am, so I, I want to throw out a bit of uh, trust just to kind of um, you know, building so you can, you know, take what I say to heart and hopefully, um, you know, based on, you know, my experiences, be able to try to um, implement some of the principles I'll lay out in your farming or gardening systems. So um, I started my career with the NRCS uh, really back in soils, back in college in Montana, and uh, I've traveled uh, across the country, as Pam mentioned, from Ohio to the Appalachian Forest, working with farmers. Um, they would make hay, worked with farmers um, you know, that would raise tobacco. Then I traveled to deep South Texas and worked with farmers um, you know, that were producing sorghum and cotton. Um, and I worked out in the brush country. Um, uh, one of the ecosystems down there is called the Chaparral. Uh, and so it's a, a very diverse, um, uh, very semi-arid environments. Uh, and then, I, like I say, I've also lived in Ohio um, where I have humid environments. And so where you're at in the country um, and what climate you're in and what soil type, um, you know, they, they matter. Um, and it, it's important to take into consideration um, these three crops we're talking about today are, are warm season crops. Uh, so we have to keep that in consideration of when your frost events uh, and your growing de- degree days occur. Um, but I'm going to step back a little bit and just kind of explain to you how the principles of soil health um, really can be applied in this gardening system and how I was introduced um, to them kind of through an awakening. So the agency um, trains all of our employees uh, employees in a, in a topic called soil quality, and then it was rebranded about you know maybe eight or nine years ago. Uh, with the term soil health. Um, there is some controversy on how to measure this and metrics, um, but I found out through my experience um, with educating our youth and our elders in our society uh, and, and all the ages in between that the, this conversation um, 
it's, it's very straightforward and can be very, very simple when we just introduce these principles. Um, so about 10 years ago, when I was in Texas, I met a dear friend who I now consider a brother. Um, he was part of, uh, is part of the Apache Nation, uh, and his role in his tribe was to be the gardener and to be the caretaker of seed and soil. Um, his name is Ray Salazar, and, uh, and he gave me a book that really brought me on my journey um, to this place I am today called The One Straw Revolution. And I know many of us have read that book, and of course it talks about do-nothing farming and farming in the image of nature and making clay pellets and, and all these amazing um, practical practices that uh, the Masanubu Fukuoka uh, developed. But really what struck me in that story was that um, his life was very parallel to my life, is the fact that he was trained classically um, to be a scientist and he was a microbiologist that would study fruit and disease and pathogen and fungi and use microscopes to, to look at the what Dr. Montgomery is coining as the hidden half of nature, um, which is a great read if you haven't had a chance to pick that one up. But uh, he um, and so he started out as a as a scientist and, and was very analytical and trained in these um, you know basically uh, reduction type of methods and uh, he had an awakening that brought him you know through through the middle part of his life uh, to back to his family farm and so I, I really admired the fact that um, yes he was a scientist but really as he grew with his wisdom and, it, and through his experience on this journey he became more of just an observer and so. Um, that said, my title is a resource soul scientist. And so science is necessary, um, but science typically doesn't solve problems. That's human creativity uh, that usually does that. And then typically when we work together. Um, and so I'm really big on, on trying to promote that with my work. And uh, so I really appreciate, you know, Pam inviting me to this group so I can hope uh, push, push some of those principles along. So um, I guess we'll start with these principles of soul health. I know Pam, it's maybe you had mentioned them before, um, but they're they're pretty general um, and they're not really cited by any you know white paper or university. Um, but the agency has been promoting uh, the first one, which is armoring your soil. Um, and so when I talk about soils with people, we talk about sometimes ground zero events. A lot of times in the Three Sisters Garden, um, they'll talk about preparing a mound or adding organic matter um, and and setting up you know different seed. Uh, positionings and plantings and and all that is fine. Um, it's what we call ground zero um, if you have to do a tillage. But what I would really like to caution and and really um, really have you all really consider when you're working in your gardens is once you do that ground zero event, there is nothing that we as humans can do to improve upon the soil ecological environments that mother nature has not already perfected. And so that's one of the the principles from the one straw revolution is that these the soil microorganisms, macro and micro, are doing things in the soil um, that our mechanics, our steel, um, our technology um, cannot replicate. And, and if we can replicate them, it usually takes either more work or more um, energy from either fuel, um, you know, running a rototiller or intensive labor. So um, I really believe there's no right or wrong um, with gardening and everyone has their own expression of self through their gardens. So I, I don't mean to say there is a right or wrong. I'm just saying that I don't believe that humans can do as good as job as the plant and the soil interfaces um, inside there. So armoring your soil is our first principle. So that's a residue. You're trying to create um, a layer that can uh, basically um, capture and deflate the rain energy or the precipitation energy as it comes from the sky. Um, it's said that rain is falling at anywhere from 25 to 35 miles an hour as it's coming from the, the sky and making an interface into the soil environment. And so we really wanna to try to armor our, our gardens and our soils as best we can. Um, obviously, once the plants have a living canopy, uh, the canopy does that, but the, uh, uh, the residue management is key and our agency has promoted that for a lot of years and so I really um, think that that was the, the first step but really putting together the whole soil health package is is being able to armor our, our soils as long as possible with our energy receptors which is um, our producers. So on the planet um, there's really only a few organisms that can take sunlight and produce it in, uh, and carry that energy into the soils. Um, so we know we have cyanobacteria which is a unique, unique group of bacteria that can photosynthesize. Um, sometimes cyanobacteria will group with uh, fungi and make lichen. 
Uh, and then the last one, the biggest, broadest group, of course, is our plants. Uh, and so we, um, as um, they have a diagram up there, I deal with trying to garden and harvest this energy at all times, whether it be with the three sisters specifically or any system that you're growing, is trying to keep this energy from the sun through the plants and putting it into our soils. And it can be feedback loop directly to the herbivores or carnivores, you know, which we, we fall under, um, or it can go through the soil food web, which is our decomposers. And so this, this diagram that shown is, is a holistic way to think about your system and trying to capture that energy, put it in motion and to manage uh, the community dynamics that foster um, that energy flow. Um, and so um, to, to do that, again, the best way I've known to do it and way I observed is to minimize our disturbance. Um, it doesn't mean that, you know, we can't uh, grow carrots in our sugar beets, but with this system, specifically the three sisters, uh, these crops are all pro producing crops that are um, above ground. Um, so this is a really easy one to harness the principle to minimize the disturbance. Um, once the seeds are planted, um, there really should be uh, little little disturbance uh, done to the soil in this system. Um, we, um, Ray Salazar taught me, we would plant in groups of three, we would take um, what he called a planting stick and we would poke holes. One person would be the one that would drive the hole in the ground. Uh, another person would actually plant the seeds in the hole and then the third person would follow and cover that seed. And we would make a disturbance maybe no bigger than a quarter uh, in our soils and sometimes as small as a dime. Uh, and so, um, that's something uh, I really like to promote. Um, the diversity is already built into this system. Uh, although these are three warm season crops, the poacea, the cucurbacea, and the fabacea are all different families of plants. Uh, so you're building diversity in the system, having different flower colors, flower types. All three of these families have extensive uh, relationship with mycorrhizae in our soils, which is a type of fungus. Uh, so they're promoting that. Um, when we till our soil or try to work in uh, green manures, we disturb mycorrhizae, their filaments in the soil. Uh, and it's a, it's a very, um, it's very harsh, uh, creates a harsh environment for them. Uh, then the last pr principle is keeping the living roots. So in this garden system, when you're growing warm season plants, I really would like you to look at your calendars and put out January to December, maybe in a three year run and look at the windows of opportunity to fill that system with other cool season plants that you can keep that sun energy flowing into our plants and into our soils. Um, the soil food web um, will feed and be active anytime our soil temperatures are below, above biological zero, which is considered 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and so that, that's another um, thing to do in this garden uh, when you're doing a warm season rotation, try to plan for cool season crops in the fall months and in the early spring months um, to keep that energy flow moving in your garden. Uh, and then the last principle that we use is incorporating um, uh, livestock. And so you can, if you are going to use amendments, try to use finished compost that have had some manure sources in there. Um, and if you have goats or sheep or whatnot, I, I think it's a great thing to let them graze and browse uh, in the garden. Um, and so if you could move to the next slide, that'd be helpful. Um, uh, let's see, I think it goes back, um, maybe, maybe one more, it's, it's to where it shows the habitat types. Let's see. Yes, that's one. Perfect. Yeah, thank you. And so real quickly, I'll wrap up here. Um, when The reason we really promote, I'm going to just focus on this disturbance, because a lot of our small scale gardeners and, and even large scale organic farms I see all across the country are using a lot of tillage. Um, and when we use tillage in our system, um, even whether it's minimum tillage or strip tillage or conservation tillage, you're really not promoting these different biospheres. Um, and so the first one I'm gonna talk about is that detritus. The detritus is the layer of interface between res uh, residues and our soil medium. Um, that layer um, creates a consistent temperature in our soils, so you don't have fluctuation. It creates habitat for spiders. Um, some earthworms dwell in the upper part of the detritus, uh, so it's really critical that you keep that, um, that layer uh, of the detritus on your soils. Um, the second one um, is the uh, rhizospheres. The rhizospheres of our plant are, are part of where that mycorrhizae network occurs. It also is where um, almost all of the soil life is, is living in very concentrated uh, population densities in and around the root zones. Uh, that's where the exudates from the, the plants as they go through photosynthesis, they're creating different um, you know, polysaccharides and different enzymes and different uh, 
chemical signatures that each species has that um, will feed the soil food web, uh, uh, basically a sugar. So plants exchange um, sugar um, for the minerals that the food web is processing through from non-plant available forms into plant available forms. Uh, many of those relationships are as old as time and have been symbiotic. Um, much of them occur long before humans, the human species was part of um, our ecosystem here on Earth. Um, and then uh, the another sphere in, that we have here in the diagram is the uh, the porosphere. So the earthworms, as they go down and they drill through the soils, they create air pockets. Um, uh, sometimes uh, that will allow roots to have an easier path to go to deeper uh, layers within your soil. Um, and the porosphere is so critical because it actually is the most influential part on gravitational water. So when we do get rain events or you uh, have an irrigation event that you put in your gardens, the interconnected porosphere will allow that water to infiltrate at higher rates and at deeper depths within your soils. If we disturb our soils, the first thing we destroy is our macro um, air spaces in our soils. And so it decreases our soil's ability to hold water and to get it into deeper depths um, to, to reduce evaporation. Um, another biosphere is the agritosphere, and that's the little aggregates of the actual building blocks of soil. So soil is made of mineral, air, water, and biology. The minerals are bound together um, with glues. Um, some of them are called glomalin from the fungi kingdoms. Uh, others are, again, these secretions from uh, the, the microbiology, and they're actually binding the aggregates together. Um, the organic matter um, also is part of binding the, the soil particles together, um, and the different minerals have different sizes. But those aggregates are, cre if you, uh, are critical because if you have a healthy soil, those aggregates are going to be resilient to hard rains. They're going to be resilient to change from air pressure inside those pores to water pressure and they'll be able to basically withstand um, extreme changes in uh, pressure basically going from air to water and so it's it's absolutely critical that we keep living plants in our soils to keep those aggregates um, fresh and, and freshly glued. Uh, another one is the um, I think I've covered them all except for maybe uh, I said the drillosphere, the detritosphere, the agosphere, and the porosphere. Um, and then the rhizosphere. So those five environments are unique um, and they occur in every soil type all over the planet and every climate. Um, and they occur only when plants are able to work and synergize with the soil food web together. So I just wanted to throw that out there um, as far as really being mindful of these environments that sometimes um, you know, just because we can't see them, it doesn't mean that they're not there. And the more we become uh, aware of them it gives us a cause and effect to our our actions and then our intentions um whether they be um you know trying to do the best can basically um result in in creating these habitats where i think will help your gardens and specifically the three sisters gardens thrive so um, that's all i have pam and i'll be open for questions later so thank you thank you very much clark uh, you've already got some good questions already okay so our second presenters are Stephen and Cindy Scott of Terroir Seeds Underwood Gardens in Tucson, Arizona. Cindy Scott is all about seeds. She has her degree in agricultural technology management with an emphasis in environmental structures management. She also has a certificate in wildlife forestry conservation. And Stephen Scott is an heirloom seedsman soil building advocate, locavore, amateur chef, and artist. Having been involved with heirloom seeds, environmental education, habitat restoration, soil health, and building local food pathways for more than 20 years. And, um, and as I also know, uh, creating, finding and making difficult seeds that are difficult to find available to major chefs in big cities too, right? Okay, let me turn this over to Cindy and Stephen. Thank you. Can, can everybody hear us? Good. Um, thank you so much, Pam. And uh, Clark, we kind of come from somewhat similar background. Uh, we worked with uh, when it was called holistic resource management and, uh, you know, when it was based in Albuquerque and, and rangeland restoration and riparian restoration. And that's where we really became involved with soils and <clears throat> years later um, 
when we started our seed company and we're kicking around names terroir is what really what really rang true for us because everything we believe everything does start with the soil so we have a lot of commonalities there and uh, i love what you talk about of not tilling and not disturbing those soil horizons and and the, the biospheres there and we bring it down to the gardener's level of of get on mother nature's team let her work for you and with you instead of working against her and, and you'll really really be amazed at uh, the results you have, the success you have. And uh, year after year, the garden will be more productive. The health uh, of the, not only the soil, but the plants will be better. Flavors will be better. Weeds will decline and decrease and, and become less. Um, the health and productivity just continues to increase, which is just kind of, kind of amazing. So um, Clark, thanks so much for, you know, your expertise in sharing that. We're going to look at the three specific uh, items in um, the the Three Sisters collection. And um, as Clark says, they're all warm season, meaning every one of them needs warm soil to be planted in. Now, to test the soil for the warmth, you can do the old English garden uh, gardener's trick of <clears throat> drop your pants and sit on the soil and if it's too cold to sit on it's too cold to plant um, or you can get a, a digital thermometer and as long as it's 70 ideally 75 degrees or better you're good to go now there's always season extending um the the french cloche the row covers you know there, there's a lot of other techniques but the the bottom line is you need a good warm soil otherwise your germination is going to be significantly delayed um five to ten degrees cooler can mean the corn um doesn't come up for three weeks that's that's how significant of a difference it can be um stoles evergreen corn is an old variety it's one of the earliest sweet corns that were really developed um came around the 1850s and it's still a white corn it, it's not a yellow corn like we're used to today um but it's got a better flavor than you're going to find with any of your hybrid super sweet corns it's not going to be quite as sugary sweet but the complexity of the flavor and the flavor profile is going to be much different corn's a heavy feeder Corn planted in poor soil is going to give a disappointing result, both in production and in flavor. Um, deep, dark, rich, black, fertile, ar aromatic soil is really what corn needs. And ideally, corn's planted in a block um, because the pollen is, is windblown. So if you can't plant in a block, then you want to put your row along the direction with the direction of the uh, the wind flow um, so that the pollen blows from the leading plant back onto the other plant so you get you get better pollination and if you do have to do rows try to do them as thick as possible don't just do one line of plants do three or four uh, if if possible what's interesting is studying the three sisters collections the three sisters uh, grouping is Research has found that the beans help the corn, the corn helps the beans, and then the squash helps everything else. Specifically, the corn with the beans, the corn can help deter bean beetles, uh, which is one of the symbiotic kind of relationships that, uh, that happen there. And let's step back just a second and look at your environment. It depends on where you're at as far as how you're going to plant your three sisters garden. If you're in the arid Southwest, you probably will do better doing it like a Zuni or a Navajo or a Hopi waffle garden, meaning you wanna dig down and you wanna put the garden in the lowest place to collect the rainwater. You want as much, you need as much water as you can get. Um, and, and instead of raising the beds, you may sink the beds so that the, that's the last place the water goes so that it has the most available water. Now, the Mandans in South Dakota, they would use the corn and beans together, but they would use the squash basically as fencing to delineate 
every family's plot or every family family's garden. So there's no one absolute right way to do the three sisters. It really kind of depends on on where you are. I was just going to throw in um, about the specific corn. Um, of course, you can use lots of different types of corn for the three sisters, but the ever uh, green corn, which is on the Ark of Taste, um, the name came from that you could pick this and it would be green, evergreen for a long time after you actually picked it. So it was a fresh corn that lasted a long time. It was one of the amazing things was, and I think it was probably found by mistake, was early frost came in and a desperate farmer just yanked the plants uh, whole, uh, didn't even pick the ears of corn, just pulled the plants up and hung them up upside down in, in a tractor shed or the horse shed at that point and uh, found that the corn continued to ripen and had ripe corn into Christmas and thus the evergreen. Thank you for that. Let's take a look at the next slide. So your Christmas lima bean is another, like we talked about, warm soil. Um, and beans help fix nitrogen from the air into the soil, um, which that helps feed the corn because the, the corn needs a fair amount of nitrogen. And that's where your compost and healthy soil really comes in. But the beans kind of give it an extra boost to give you better flavor and better production. Um, pole beans versus um, bush beans. And again, that kind of depends on your environment here in the Southwest where we have some pretty strong winds. Um, a, a mild breeze for us is 20 miles an hour. Um, it gets a little windy about 35 or 40, um, kind of like the, the plains in some areas. So we really like the pole beans because they help climb up the, the stalks of the, the corn and help anchor them so that they don't, it's called lodging, uh, meaning it falls over. Uh, they don't lodge nearly as much. This is also one of the benefits of your heirloom corn is they've got, uh, a lot of them have wider root systems to help prevent lodging over because they're, they're not planted as tightly as some of the hybrid corn. And so they don't depend on each other to, uh, um, you know, to keep, to, to keep upright. Um, if you are in an area that doesn't have quite as much wind, a uh, bush bean can work just as well. Um, and you can also use both. You can do some bush and some pole beans the bush beans help uh, shade the soil, which helps protect moisture, which helps keep the roots and the soil cooler. Uh, so it moderates the plant stress over the hot summer. Uh, so you get more consistent growth um, and you're not losing uh, nearly as much uh, moisture from the air. Um, the, uh, the, the, the Christmas lima beans, they're uh, a wonderfully nutty, very flavorful, um, bean and, and folks that say they don't like beans and especially don't like lima beans because what they're used to is the, the styrofoam peanuts that uh, are sold in the, in the supermarket store that, that really don't have any, any flavor. People are always just amazed at the, the flavor of homegrown food and especially the heirlooms that have been. From one generation to another um and and one of the nice things with the christmas is not only is it pretty but it's big so you get a lot of food production in a fairly small uh, fairly small space one of the things i was going to say is depending on the age group of if it's a school garden and you're working with younger kids versus older kids you might keep that in mind whether you use a pole bean or a bush bean because a bush bean for younger kids is going to be at their level a pole bean, it might be a lot taller and more up the stock for, uh, you know, uh, middle school to high school students. So there's just something to keep in mind if you're using it as a teaching element and you want them to be picking the produce. Uh, just, you know, age specific is helpful as well. Can be a treasure hunt. So let's take a look at the next slide. And um, the Long Island cheese pumpkin and pumpkins and squash are in the same family. So your summer squash, your winter squash, and your pumpkins um, kind of are all lumped into the same family. The biggest difference between a summer squash and a winter squash is the summer squash 
they won't keep, meaning you can't pick them and put them in storage and they're going to be good two or three or six months later. Whereas your winter squash, even though it says winter, and I get these questions all the time is when do I start my winter squash? Well, you started, you know, early because it needs to mature. It's called a winter squash because it has a hard rind like a pumpkin or a butternut squash or that sort of thing. And that hard rind allows it to be stored for a number of months after it's, after it's harvested. Um, and again, warm soil, um, 70 degrees or above or better. Um, the ideal germination for all three of these varieties is 80 degree soil. If we're doing germination testing, we're doing, uh, we're keeping the germination chamber at 80 to 85 um, to, to get the germination quickly. Because again, if uh, you don't, um, if you don't have, if, even if you have like a 70 degree soil, um, it's going to take, take longer. And you're, it's always amazing how much longer just a couple degrees makes. So conversely, if you're planting these into the garden and you have the choice to wait a week, and sometimes that's not always possible with a school garden, but if you can wait a few days or a week, because of variable weather or it might warm up, I always encourage waiting because it's going to sprout faster um, when you wait just a little bit. So the, the pumpkins tend to not be quite as heavy feeders as the, um, um, especially the corn, but the beans as well. Uh, the biggest thing they, for best flavor and production, they definitely like a richer soil. But the big things with your pumpkins is they like to sprawl. They can take up, um, you know, two pumpkin plants can take up as much as, as a couple hundred corn, uh, corn stalks. So be aware of that. But one of the things you can do with the pumpkins is you can train those vines as they're growing, as, as you plant them. And, it, and again, it depends. If you're in the Southwest and you're doing more of the, the Zuni or Hopi or Navajo a waffle type garden, a sunken type garden, the squash is going to be in there shading the beans and shading the soil uh, to, to help retain moisture. If you're doing it more of the mandan style where the, the squash or the outside of the, the planting, um, you can train those vines in there with that. It just really depends on what you need. Uh, but just be aware you're going to have some sprawling growth that you're going to, to need to corral if it's a raised bed or a square foot gardening type thing, uh, we always encourage planting the pumpkins on the corners because they can sprawl into the walkways or you can direct them back in where you need them. You can plant other things underneath um, the leaves because they do help uh, shade and keep that soil a lot cooler and a lot more moist. Uh, I did have something come to my mind. It just went out. Um, depending on your space constraints, I think this pumpkin's about up to about 20 pound pumpkin, I believe the cheese gets to. So if you have space constraints, you can do something more like the New England sugar pie or something like the just flip pumpkin. I realize some garden spaces are, are small. And so if you're trying to do this on a smaller scale, you could swap out some of the seeds to get something a little smaller, more handleable for your space. And, and we're focusing on these specific varieties because these are on the arc of taste and Slow Food USA is working with them. So that's why we wanted to talk about them, but we also wanna make sure you understand that th these aren't the only three choices that are out there. There's, there's a lot of different choices based on your particular garden, whether you've got a 15 by 30 garden or you've got uh, containers or you've got three quarters of an acre. I mean, I've seen school gardens that had, you know, those are, those are three examples of school gardens we've worked with. So um, one of the neat things with the pumpkins and the squash is if you play your cards right and if you're really observant, what's really cool is you can grow some heat intolerant herbs, specifically like a cilantro, underneath the shade of the leaves of a pumpkin. And we were really amazed one year watching a beginning gardener, not knowing really what they were doing, kind of doing the square foot gardening thing. And they had cilantro in the square foot next to the pumpkin. And uh, they just redirected those vines to cover the cilantro. And they had fresh cilantro that did not bolt uh, into August. So they had two months of 100 plus degree days and the cilantro was just cranking right along and it was wonderful. So 
that's more of your companion or teamwork type uh, planting. So it, it, really, uh, it really can make a difference. And those are some of the really cool things that you can encourage with observation with school kids is, uh, hey, look at this and look what's happening here and look underneath the leaves, see how moist it is, see how uh, cool it is versus two feet away where the soil is dry and hard. And it's a lot of those kind of lessons that really, um, you know, and, and it's amazing how, how the kids bring that, bring that in and take it home and then come back with some pretty advanced questions that, that have always taken me by surprise. You're like, wow, though, you've really been thinking about this and that's awesome. So let's go to the next slide and then we're gonna we're gonna wind up with uh building soil um <laughs> and uh thanks for 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 uh the introduction again clark so if you're wondering why the backgrounds on our slides have been sunflowers it's because the the sunflower is kind of the fourth elder or eldest sister uh, sunflowers were the, as far as we know from research, the very first domesticated food in North America. Um, lots of digs, lots of research going on that have, have seen how sunflowers have traveled um, with hunter gatherers. And as, as people started, uh, uh, different tribes started becoming a little more farming and, and away from the, you know, strictly the nomadic hunter gatherer. So, uh, we, we consider sunflower the elder sister, and uh, they also work very well in, in the three sisters because of shade, because of windbreak, uh, because of a cover crop, and they're heavy roots that dig down and break up soil and really help improve the, the roots over time. So now you understand kind of the Easter egg in the, <laughs> the presentation. Um, as far as gardening, uh, the two things, the three things actually that we consistently have worked with customers all across the country is, is improving the soil. Um, your compost, um, and as Clark says, an animal-based, manure-based compost, sometimes it can be, in, in cities can be a little more difficult to find. Um, we've worked with uh, basically stacking the nutrition, um, coffee grounds, charcoal, uh, uh, minerals, milk and molasses, some of these kind of things. And that's where the, uh, the bit.ly link is to the, the compost article we have. And then Clark also mentioned a little bit um, cover crops. Um, in the fall, you can do some cover crops in the spring. This is getting a lot more in depth than we're really focusing here, but we wanted to show you some other tools and techniques to help you be very successful. Um, and then there's the, the, uh, the short link for that. But to close, one of the best ways to improve the uh, production and uh, amazement in the garden, especially for kids uh, and school children, doesn't matter if they're preschool or high school, um, is pollinating uh, attracting flower mixes. Whether it's the whether you focus on the monarchs or whether you do more of a honeybee, bumblebee, butterfly, or uh, hummingbird mix getting some of those in, getting a lot more, you know, uh, just loads more pollinators into the garden. Um, and it doesn't matter whether it's, you know, a fruit, a vegetable garden, a fruit garden, or what we're talking about with the three sisters, more pollinators means the pollen gets spread better and you're going to have bigger and better um, produce. So, you know, uh, and it's really going to make a difference long, you know, long run, but also that season. And so let's go to the next slide. So we want to thank you so much for the time and uh, thank you for your, your attention. Uh, please visit us. Um, we do have a pretty active Facebook group. Uh, we do a weekly newsletter as well. If you have questions, you can email us or give us a call. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Stephen and Cindy. Wow. Oh, I think what I'll do, uh, we'll make this available to people um, so people can listen to this again. And we'll make the slides available. And I think I will actually write up the information that's coming out of this because there's a lot. 
and put it on my Mother Earth News blog and make it available that way. And also the answers to the questions. So we have some great questions. Uh, let me see. Okay. What do you do if you are starting a new bed for the three sisters and there is grass there? Can you remove this? Oops, just lost it. Uh, I know the question is, can you remove the sod and add a layer of compost and manure? And that came in, Clark, during your talk. So maybe you okay. want to take the, do the first answer? Yeah, it gets back to the diagram I put out with um, the sun creates radiation. The radiation um, is turned into heat once it hits the plant leaves and starts the process we all know as photosynthesis. Um, so I'm pretty passive, you know, I'm under the Gandhian principle as all life has equal parts of life, you know, kind of thing. And uh, we need to be respectful of that. Um, that said, I use a technique called a passive solarization. Um, and so I use black breathable landscape fabric and you need about six weeks before you want to change your ecological environment. So say in Colorado, we're at 5,000 feet about May 15th or May you know, 20th, we're gonna have the temperatures that Steve was mentioning in our soils. So I'd go back six weeks from then and I would lay um, the, the, the black breathable landscape fabric over the area that I was wanting to change the ecological community. And I would let passive solarization um, block the photosynthetic pathway of those plants. And th they typically will die. Um, you can get about a 70, 80% kill. Um, another way to do it is to use a tool. Um, we, we call it like uh, with scalping. Um, and so like say it's, it's May 1st and you, wanna, and you wanna change this environment. There's a tool where you can, has like, it's like a hoe and it has like an angle to it. It's very, very subtle. And you can take it and you can scalp the sod. Um, and try to get the crown um, and that's a way to change ecological environment um, and then worst case scenario you know ground zero fill it up lay you know three inches of compost three inches of straw and then plant your 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 heirloom three sister seeds or whatnot so that, that's how i would take it and probably and put those in ranking them as far as uh, how to manage for soil health the only other thing i would add would be <clears throat> Um, on Clark's last statement is if you need to do the tilling and that go in with a cover crop mix, uh, rye, vetch, um, some, of, some of those types of cover crops, you're not going to get planting that season because it's going to need the season to chase away the roots and but it's going to greatly improve your soil for next season. So if you have to go with kind of the, the third option, then you might consider uh, putting some cover crops in there and, and just really uh, boosting the soil for next year. Mm. All right, thank you very much. Um, I keep losing my place because people keep asking questions, which is wonderful, but it keeps making this uh, the chat bounce. So I have to keep finding my place. Okay. Okay, will your slides be available to us? Yes, no problem. Clark, could you repeat the second principle, please? It's the next uh, question. I think when we list them, I believe it's minimized disturbance. So back to the, the same answer is that, that we cannot create the environment in these soils, nor do we need to for our plants to, to foster on their own. They've had these relationships with the soil food web long before we, we came in. That said, when we're mining the soils, when we're, we're constantly taking the whole bean and the whole corn plant, using them for baskets or different materials and taking the lignin compounds and those long carbon chains, and we're removing everything back that's when, yeah, we'll need to add amendments uh, to get back. But it's basically just minimize disturbance. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Also, will a transcript of the presentation be available? Um, let me look into this and I'll get back to you on the group. If it won't, if I won't do a, a transcript, I will do a summary um, and post it on the Mother Earth News blog. But I would like to do transcript. It's just a matter of time. <laughs> we'll also post so, both the the deck, the presentation, and a recording of the video in the Facebook group. And we also put the um, link to the deck in this chat box, so you can access it there. Thank you. Okay, next question. Ah, looking for a recommendation for early season corn, 
suitable for cool and foggy San Francisco. Does anybody um, on this uh, chat have any uh, any present any of the presenters have any ideas? And if not, I know where to ask. A, a short season corn is what you're going to be looking for, um, but also ones that are adapted to a cooler season climate. Um, there's some, um, I don't remember the names of them right now, but there's some, there's some heirloom corns that are being reintroduced out of the Northeast and um, they're, they're, they're really good with the cooler season and the, the variable weather. Um, Bloody Butcher is one that's, that's pretty hardy. Um, Country Gentleman is another one um, that's uh, Country Gentleman is actually like an 83 day, 83 to 100 day uh, variety, which is which is pretty short. Um, other than that, your smaller varieties of corn are going to do uh, pretty pretty well. Okay, um, I would also um, recommend if you like go to Seed Savers Exchange and, and look it up there and ask your Arc of Taste in, Cal in California and see what they recommend. Um, and if, if the, none of those satisfy you, um, certainly there are farmers I know who we can ask there. Okay, next question. What is the best method to test your soil health? And before I let the presenters answer this, I just want to say that uh, one of the uh, ways uh, is has been posted on the resource documents in our group and it is by Professor Miguel Altieri of Berkeley uh, an agroecologist and he created a soil test uh, that is using observation only including smell and taste and he designed it for um, for grape growing situation but it's pretty universal and you can use it and adapt it to your situation so go on to our group and find that document in the resource document but there are many other answers so who wants to take this first when I I'm ready. Clark yes oh, yeah we so just um, you know I think the age group is really important so we talked a lot about children um, I do the five senses in our soils um, with our children all the time. It's very successful. Uh, you get them to taste, smell, um, touch, describe colors, um, changing colors, close their eyes and feel the soil. Um, but but really, if you're looking at it, it's it's the smell um, of the soil, um, the amount of critters and life and the vibrancy you see in the soil. Um, you know, you can also go very analytical, um, Dr. Um, uh, Albrecht and Kerry Reams uh, through the Acres USA group. If you look at some of their research uh, through Charles Walter's work, um, they, they go through the mineral profiles and talk about getting your mineral profiles lined up. And a lot of that will be uh, able to unlock if you manage for the um, unlock the mineral and energy flow into your souls. If you unlock the um, soul food web, you know, in that combination. Uh, so you can kind of go that route. Um, but yeah, I, I really I really like people just to understand um, that, that children um, can quickly tell you a healthy soil from an unhealthy soil and that all soil has the ability to change its health. Uh, I would put that out there that it can get better or worse. And sometimes by our uh, practices, um, you can upgrade soil, build it up or degrade it. And then sometimes during the year, it can go through both of those processes. And so um, the, the soil can always, it can always um, do better and just compare yourself to yourself over time. Thank you. And um, I look into posting more on that in addition to the Miguel Altieri uh, test. But that's, that is a pretty fun one for kids because you can map it into an amoeba. So look at the, the, the our resource documents. Um, okay, the next question. It's actually my question. Um, and uh, this was during um, uh, Stephen and Cindy's presentation. It's a question on when, uh, question on when nitrogen becomes available to corn. Some say, and uh, a very respected agronomist recently told me that the nitrogen mostly is only in the beans themselves. So if you eat the beans, you're not returning uh, any nitrogen to the soil, or you're returning very little. And some say that's not true. 
Um, some say there is a nit nitrogen from stalk and leaf mulch, so the plant has to be dead, and you have to actually mulch it. And then the nitrogen becomes available for the microorganisms, and other people say, well, that's not true. The nitrogen is available to assist the corn while the beans are still planted, and the corn and beans are still alive. So um, I would like comments on that from all you guys. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think it depends. Uh, one is it depends on the type of bean. It depends on how strong of a nitrogen fixer it is. It also depends on the soil, um, whether there is the uh, bacteria in uh, um, micro communities to facilitate the nitrogen fixation. Um, but this is also why you don't plant the three sisters into concrete or into brand new soil that's never had anything done with it or to, you know, why you don't plant the three sisters into the playground sandbox um, because it can't manufacture all of its nutrition immediately. This is where going into uh, a good, rich, healthy, fertile soil uh, with the characteristics that Clark describes is um, is key. Um, the The beans are going to help, but they aren't the only provider. Um, and and I would say that they probably do provide some nitrogen. They definitely aren't going to provide all the nitrogen, or possibly even the majority of the nitrogen. I would say the majority of the nitrogen is probably in a home garden coming from uh, animal manure-based compost from the previous seasons. Clark? Yeah, I just, you know, be cautious about all, all of the, the things that we think we know as humans, you know, um, there are rhizobacteria that Steve is referring to that live in legumes. Um, so the first thing you can do is pull your, your bean plants out, out, you know, and look at them during the season and cut the, the the nodule in half and make sure it's red or pink if it's red or pink it's actively fixing nitrogen it's a quick way to, to see if you've got that budget um, the plant will take care of itself first uh, usually the legume but there's probably a little bit of excess lag and then I would just challenge you know how does the prairie grow how does the forest grow um, these free living nitrogen fixing bacteria are by the the millions um, we cannot uh, quantify them in laboratories we haven't been able to put genus and species on them they swap dna based on temperature and environment so there's a lot more going on in the soils than we know about um, that said um, you can quickly see if your plants are deficient um, by how vigorous they are the color of the leaf pattern um, and so you want to set yourself up for success, but, you know, there's no harm in trying, you know, if you plant the three sisters and the garden is unsuccessful um, based on fertility, um, it's a good lesson learned and you can work on that budget by using amendments uh, and however forms of nitrogen, but um, all plant tissue has some forms of nitrogen in it. Um, and the air is 78% nitrogen. So really nitrogen isn't really um, a limitation. Uh, if you can get the food web moving it through. Um, and so uh, the air and the pores in the, the soil have, have nitrogen in the air, but it just has to go through um, the different forms. Uh, so you have inorganic nitrogen and organic nitrogen. The compost, um, typically when they're in the fields, are it's tied up in organic nitrogen. So you have a carbon to nitrogen ratio. And as it goes through the, the soil food web, it unlocks that and it goes through the ammonium or the nitrate um, that typically we hear is plant available. But uh, um, it, it's complicated, but just do your best. And with your intention, I think you're going to have some really good results. Okay, thank you both. And I remember reading just recently um, about a corn that actually fixes nitrogen. So I'm going to have to go back and find that reference. Um, so let's see the next one. What are good crops for the three sisters before the soil is warm? I would say your cool season crops, your coal um, crops, <clears throat> kale, cabbages, um, spinach, broccoli, uh, your cruciferous um, lettuce, basically anything that does well in a cooler soil. And some of those things that I just mentioned will germinate down to about 50 or 55 degree soil temperature. So you can plant those. And from a gardening perspective, you can plant those and get a food crop prior to planting the, the three sisters. So that gives you a double harvest. And then if you stack that again 
and in the early late summer early fall you go back to your uh, um, your cool season crops then that gives you th three harvests over the season um, and depending on your environment if you can do uh, a hoop house a high tunnel a row cover whatever to grow further into the year and Clark touched on this on his presentation but the longer you have active living roots in the soil uh, the longer throughout the year you have that, the healthier your soil is going to be because of all of the microbiological communities are more active for longer during the year. Thank you very much. And I, I just want to add that um, I spoke recently with uh, Dr. Jane Mount Pleasant, who is a, an agronomist who teaches at Cornell, and she focuses her research totally on three sisters in the East, indigenous ag in the East. Uh, she herself is indigenous and she said that um, because the soils are so good on the east coast as long as you maintain the soil uh, as was proven by the native american practices as long as you maintain the soil by not tilling then it, you don't have to worry about nitrogen or anything else you just have to that soil will remain fertile as long as you, you plant it the way clark said that his friend taught him to plant it Right. So, okay, um, does corn transplant effectively mm -hmm. from a greenhouse to the field? We do, and it, it transplants effectively. But presenters, what are your... Um, I, would, I would say, depending on your environment, if you have a shorter season uh, environment or it doesn't warm up until midsummer, um, mm -hmm. transplanting could be the answer because I see a lot of questions related can you transplant the squash and the beans and things instead of direct so and I think it depends on your environment what you're planting if you have a shorter cooler summer then doing transplants is probably the more effective way to actually get a production out of those crops the thing you really have to be careful of um with transplanting corn and, and beans and squash, because traditionally they're not. Their roots are very delicate, very sensitive to changes. So um, they're not going to take transplant shocks like tomatoes and peppers and eggplants. They, they're, if they bounce back, they're going to bounce back a month later, um, which just costs you, you know, your, your head start. So the thing that we found is if you do start those inside, start them in larger, larger soil containers, um, not your little seedlings, but like a six or an eight inch container, and then just be super, super careful as you as you do your transplant. Clark, what's your experience? I, I like to plant them with by seed mostly, but I agree with you. Um, we have another friend of mine, Dan Kittredge. He's a Bionutrient Association a leader in uh, the East Coast. And uh, he talks a lot about, um, and John Kemp is another uh, expert. They talk about some of the corn plants. Um, they can actually read their environment. So when you start plants in small containers, um, by almost by the 14th day in these life cycles of this plant, once it germinates, it's basically reading its mineral profile. And you can actually reduce and stunt yields because that plant will only think, I've only got, you know, three square inches to work with here. And so when you, I noticed you, you can see that difference when you have tomatoes that go to seed that were from container that actually go to seed in your gardens. A lot of times those plants will be more vigorous. So that's a theory. I've heard both of those, um, those guys put out. So, um, yeah, just like I said, just make sure that soil temperature is, is ready for a warm season plant and uh, do your best. Um, I, I, of the three, I've had the most success transplanting um, squash. Okay, and I have an answer from my husband who does this. He says, uh, need to transplant it three inches or less tall, plant about three weeks before setting out, cover with row cover and transplant into very wet soil. And that's yeah. that's been successful for us. So. Yeah. Um, okay, it's 4:04 uh, .04 p.m. and we said that we would uh, end at no later than 4:15. Are people willing to hang on till then, or should we uh, just answer the last few questions online? I'm gonna let's just take let's take one more and see where we're at time-wise. Um, okay, should the squash be started indoors and transplanted to when weather warms, or planted at the same time? And I know that squash should be the last, technically, I mean, the, traditionally the last plant of the three planted. But presenters, what do you say? 
So the squash be started indoors and transplanted when weather warms or planted at the same time? It's pretty much like we talked about with the corn as well, because I think we kind of covered the three um, yeah. the three varieties. I mean, they do have some some variances, but you know they're all warm warm soil crops, so they all should be treated kind of the same. I mean, they are going to have some differences, but it's the same sort of thing. If you do need to start it indoors, start it in a larger pot. Be really careful on your transplanting, um, Clark. Yeah, I agree. Yep. And just the squash and spacing, you know, I think from the Iroquois garden in the East Coast, uh, you're going to have more seeds of corn and, and beans um, to, to squash ratio. So it's just you're going to need a little more space for that, that, um, that plant, the cucurbacea to spread out. But yeah, I agree. Okay, um, we have another three and I wonder if we could get through these really fast. Can you give us a diagram of the best planting configurations? And before I turn it over to you guys, I just want to say that um, two articles were recently posted. They are in our resource document, and they were posted as well. One is from Native Seed Search, and that has a, um, a, print, a printable diagram for, sheet for teachers for schools, and that, it, that gives some planting diagrams. And then um, the Cornell University Extension has other planting diagrams. Uh, whether they're the best probably depends on your particular situation. Presenters, what would you say for a diagram of the best planting configurations? I was going to say, but your the resources you listed are probably really good. I know yeah. Native Search has done a lot with that. Um, it really, I think, depends on your environment. So I would mm -hmm. encourage, you know, talking to other gardeners in your area other schools and things that have done this before because i know like even up at in uh, flagstaff at the museum of northern arizona they had a demonstration garden and it was completely different for the three sisters planting there because of the wind so uh, i think each environment probably lends itself to how you're going to want to plant and it, experimentation is part of gardening and i would really yeah. encourage that yeah i would i would definitely say it depends on your environment from the mandan to the waffle gardens that I talked about and to what Clark talked about with the Iroquois, those are vastly different environments. So don't be afraid to experiment and what might be best for your environment is pretty much breaking all of the established rules, but it works for you. And a way to find some uh, good people who could advise on this, if you want some advice on what other people have done. Yeah, other schools, definitely. Museums, definitely. And find the indigenous and heirloom gardeners who, who plant in your place. And you can find them at seed exchanges often. Just, go to, just show up at a seed exchange, even if you have nothing to bring. Just go to meet people. Um, OK, Clark, did you want to uh, give any answers to that about diagrams and planting? Uh, human creativity, I think those are all sound great. I, I looked at the one on the Cornell site and it, and it looked fabulous. So, um, yeah. Okay, great. Um, okay, next question. Next to last question. Have you ever heard that sunflowers might be allelopathic to beans? I have come across that um, in my reading on, in the internet. Uh, what do you guys say? Sunflowers are one of the most allelopathic next to rye. Um, <laughs> that there is. Um, and that's good and bad. I mean, it's very good for weed suppression. Um, and the other thing to consider is how long that allelopathic effect lasts. So if you want to plant your beans right among your sunflowers, you're going to have some challenges. Mm -hmm. However, if you want to have your sunflowers as a windbreak three feet away, you're fine. Um, yeah. So it, it just really kind of depends on on what you're looking at. It's, it's all, it also depends on if you're planting by seed, which the allelopathic effect is going to really challenge the seed germination versus transplanting. Mm -hmm. um, the allelopathic effect has much less of an impact on a transplant, especially a, a sturdy, strong, not a two or three inch seedling, but a foot tall seedling. Um, the allelopathic effect is going to be greatly reduced on that. Okay, who ah, wants yes. to define allelopathic? Yes. Somebody yes. asked, please define allelopathic. Um, and, and Clark helped me out with this. The allelopathic effect is a, technically it's a root exudate. Basically it's mm -hmm. a phytochemical that the root exudes 
that uh, decreases the ability of other seeds in the soil to germinate. Now, the reason that rye and vetch and some of those are used as cover crops and to chase weeds away is they exude these, this, this um, phytochemical and the weed seeds can't germinate for sometimes six weeks, so four to six weeks. So then you can go in, plant your cover crops, uh, get them up, mow them down after they're about a foot tall. Then you can go in and transplant and you're going to be pretty much weed free for about a month. Um, so the alleliopathic effect just means that it's a weed suppression phytochemical. Thank you very much. OK, last question. Oh, wait, did somebody want to say something? Clark, did you want to add something? No, that's perfect. Sounds great. Yep. OK, last question. Do I need to rotate? Ah, do I need to rotate the three sisters' garden, or how long can we plant in the same space? Good question. That's a good question. It's uh, an annual crop, right? These are annual crops. So I, I think I didn't mention this in my intro. Is givers and takers. So um, this is an American Indian principle that we're learning from from the Iroquois um, and other nations and. Um, one thing about the Westerners, when we came to America, we were a taking culture. Um, and what I learned from my friend Ray is, is, is the give, giving culture. And so um, when we teach organic farmers um, or when they teach us to, um, we wanna give um, more than we take from our resources, especially our soils. So we, you can plant in rotation two or three years in the same spot, but then make sure you're giving two or three years back in a row. Some people do this in circles, some people do it in rows. There is no wrong or right, um, but just be mindful that we, we want to try to give back as much as we take or if not more to our soil. So when you do rotations, you can do that with cover crops or with plants that you're not actually mining from. But um, that's my take on it. Steve, what's your opinion? And Cindy? Well, I really like the term you use on mining because that truly dis um, describes what happens if you grow heavy feeders, you know, if you have tomatoes and then uh, corn and then you know you go back to something like an eggplant or peppers or that sort of thing is those are heavy feeders they need a lot of nutrients um, and so if you don't give back or put back or feed the soil then over and sometimes it's in as few as three years you'll start to see that the flavor declines the health of the plant declines there's more pests um, there's more disease, things are just, you know, you can tell they're going downhill. So I, I really like that term mining. Um, so yeah, you do need to rotate. Um, there's a ton of different ways to rotate. And, um, you know, like Clark said, um, something as simple as a cover crop at the end of the season, you know, you might be able to plant in the same, in the same spot year after year, but if you do a cover crop, you're replenishing the soil. And, compost and you know these kind of things so yeah you definitely need to take care and feed the soil okay thank you very much thank you everybody who is on this group i hope this will generate a lot of good discussion back on our facebook group thank you so much cindy and stephen and clark for presenting and being with us and enlightening us and um anna thank you for organizing this and back to you Thanks, everyone. I really appreciate your work. Um, and it's been great to hear this. I've learned a lot myself. We will, as um, Pam says, we'll post some of this in our Facebook group. And right now, as Slow Food Tradition, I'm going to unmute everyone, and we can all say goodbye at the same time. So here we go. Everyone is unmuted. Thank you. Bye, so everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.